as I've said before from this podium, Speaker McCarthy is beholden to the most extreme members of his conference. Last week, we saw proof of that. On Thursday, the House Freedom Caucus, in between drafting impeachment articles and defunding a program to help sick veterans get health care, called for a pause in negotiations. On Friday, the Speaker complied, and his emissaries stormed out of the negotiating session. Since then, they've added new extreme demands to their ransom list, including provisions of the Partisan Child Deportation Act, which passed without a single Democratic vote. The Speaker insists that there won't be draconian cuts and yet continues to say the spending levels must go down. His position is simply untenable. Based on what Republicans have shown us with their appropriations bills, we are looking at a 30% cut across the board to the remaining domestic programs. That's based on what we know. The chaos and the confusion has now drifted into the committee room. Four appropriations bills are now on pause, and the full committee markups have now been delayed. House Democrats are not going to sign on to devastating cuts for teachers, food assistance, or Medicaid. Speaker McCarthy needs to get serious before he sends the country spiraling into a recession. Now recognize Vice Chair Ted Lieu. Uh, thank you, Chairman Aguilar. Remember the last time when Democrats controlled a chamber and we went to the brink of defaulting on the debt and crashing the economy under a Republican president? Yeah, me neither, because Democrats aren't extreme. This is beyond the norm, and if you describe this as a negotiation of both sides issue, you're misleading the public. Because Republicans, see, have this button here that they push and it's crash the economy. So they can say, hey, you don't provide billions for a border wall, we're going to push this button and crash the economy. You don't go to agree to these devastating cuts that are going to cause over 100,000 jobs to be lost, we're going to push this button here and crash the economy. This is not a negotiations. This is a hostage taking well beyond the norm. And this is how you should report it. Yield back. Questions? Nick? Sir, on the discharge petition, uh, it looks like you guys are getting pretty close to getting every single Democrat on board. What is your pitch to Republicans on that petition, especially when you, you know, Democrats haven't decided yet on what, the, what will be discharged? Our position to Republicans is let's avoid this catastrophic default. If you're serious about avoiding default, come talk with us. We have said that this is a break glass provision. We are happy to engage with them and to talk with them about measures that will prevent us from a catastrophic default that would hurt the economy uh, and is Republican-led. Uh, we want to make sure that we are doing everything we can uh, to create an opportunity uh, to avoid that. And so our pitch to them is simple. Don't just talk moderate when it comes time to give interviews and go on TV. Work with us. Govern. Prevent catastrophe. That's our overarching message. If they want to be partners in this, uh, they, know, they know how to find us. And we're happy to work through solutions uh, that can get to 218 votes. Sure. Back. Thank you. Um, so Speaker McCarthy told us last night that he and the president are in agreement that um, if permitting reform is a part of um, a deal on the debt ceiling, it would have to address um, removing red tape for oil and gas projects in addition to renewable energy projects, and maybe even that the um, permitting reforms that would help fossil fuel projects would actually come ahead of renewable energy projects and that you would go at that at a later date. Is this something that Democrats would support as part of the debt ceiling? Proposal? We haven't seen any details on this, so I'm not going to speculate. Um, we have seen uh, the White House has put out you know, white papers on permitting reform. Uh, there are uh, efforts here in the House um, uh, that Democrats are working on. Uh, the New Democratic Coalition has, has put together some items on permitting reform that includes transmission as well. Uh, we believe that uh, renewable energy 
um, uh, is important and offers an ability to create jobs and provide uh, energy in the future. Uh, we want to make sure that that, that isn't uh, delayed or compromised. Uh, those are our principles. We're happy to have conversations uh, about uh, what that entails, um, but we don't have any details um, at this point on what could be included. Okay. Okay. Max? So six days ago, you said you were incredibly scared with how the debt limit situation was. You know, six days later, how do you describe your feelings about the chance of default? Yeah, it's still, um, I think I think a lot of us are, you know, a little shocked um, that we keep getting this close. Um, Ten days, nine days, um, you know, this is this is tough. This is not where we where we should be. Uh, Speaker McCarthy is being held captive by the Freedom Caucus, so now we have 72-hour uh, requirements. So anytime there is, you know, a deal, we have to back in to that timeline. Uh, you guys have reported on the difficulty that that could, you know, mean to to um, to getting to a deal. Uh, you know, we agree. We share that concern. Uh, we're concerned about the timeline. We're concerned uh, that Republicans. Uh, are not only moving the goalposts, but continue to hold out uh, to the most extreme elements of their proposals, even adding you know, the medieval wall and HR2 provisions uh, to, this, to this discussion uh, that wasn't included in their default on America plan uh, that they passed. Uh, so so that, that, that concerns us. It concerns us greatly uh, on timing. Uh, again, you know, our concern is uh, that we keep getting closer, um, that Republican so-called moderates, uh, you know, can work with us on this, and you know they give you know happy moderate talk in interviews, um, but they have shown no willingness uh, to compromise and to govern uh, and to avoid this catastrophe. Chad, thank you. Good morning. Can you characterize kind of where your sense of uh, where the caucus is right now based on the negotiations? I mean, we heard some pretty positive things last night from the speaker. We heard some pretty positive things from the president. Yet, you know, I listened to some of your remarks and, and, and the whip and, and the leader out, out on the steps here, and it seemed like there was a, a bit of a, a chasm between what the White House was saying and what you guys were saying and what and what some members uh, more on the liberal liberal side of your caucus want. Is there some divide between the White House? And is there something that you guys need to push for to make sure, is it, was this an effort to make sure that they don't give up the farm in this negotiation? There's no divide. There's no divide. We have, we have said uh, from the very beginning, uh, that we are not going to stand by as devastating cuts are put in place that harm the economy and harm our communities. Uh, that's what Democrats stand for. Those are our, our main principles. Uh, we continue uh, to, to have that position. And I think, you know, what you heard from us is, you know, merely, you know, amplifying that Republicans have, are creating this artificial cliff. They are changing the elements of negotiation. Uh, we are happy that people are talking, uh, of course. Uh, that's better than the alternative. But they still are being held by the most extreme portions of their conference in what they're asking for. And we continue to, to feel that that is you know, unproductive and that isn't you know, pointing toward progress. The president has said, we want to make robust investments in in our budget. It'll create jobs, it'll help our communities, it'll support our economy. Uh, Republicans have said we want to roll back to FY22 cuts, we want to cut $130 billion out of the federal budget, we want to take food out of the, out of the mouths of, of families. Uh, what the president has come back at, what you heard the leader say, is we can have conversations about holding the line on spending at FY23 levels. Uh, that is a completely reasonable position in exchange for a two-year increase in the debt limit. Can you just follow up for a minute? Was your audience at, the, at that point really the White House last night? I mean, trying to say, as you just put it, don't you know, give up too much. Hold the line on that spend. Was I, that your audience last I, night? I think, I think the White House knows exactly where we are, um, and, and we've commuted that, communicated that to them. Uh, what, what the Democratic whip and the Democratic leader uh, also, uh, what we all have in front of us is making sure that whatever is agreed to uh, has the votes. And it has been very clear from the beginning that Kevin McCarthy cannot carry a bill to fix the debt limit 
that has 60 votes in the Senate and has support here. And, you know, he's going to continue to be concerned about his future job prospects. So what we are saying is, you know, let's let's get to the bottom of this. Let's have conversations about where this lands. Um, but, you know, holding firm to their you know, continued positions to harm the economy and, and hurt our communities uh, is not where this should end up. Sure. And, and I just want to add why this situation is different than other budget negotiations and so on, because a default is permanent. We can't reverse it. Once it happens, companies and businesses and banks and other countries will know we defaulted once on our debt and that, in fact, the validity of our public debt can be questioned. And that is going to have permanent ramifications for the American people and their children and their grandchildren. In the back. As soon as those does come together, how heavy of a lift do you think you guys are going to have when it comes to like how many votes you're going to have to deliver? And if, if the deal comes out of this that has Joe Biden saying he's achieving, should we assume that that's going to be easy, that that's an easy message to help Democrats? Or do you think that's going to be difficult if you guys have to deliver 80, 90 votes? I think that's a I think that's a question for the Democratic whip. Uh, thankfully, that is that is not the the position that that uh, the vice chair and I have today. Um, look, I mean, the reality is, you know, you tell me what's in the deal, and and we can probably have a conversation on how many votes uh, that uh, that we can provide within our within our caucus. Uh, we don't know the elements of of what's in the deal, and so uh, we we couldn't speculate. Um, but I don't think anybody should assume that the the Democratic caucus is uh, going to support something that uh, harms our economy, um, uh, no matter uh, who supports it. Hey, are you open to uh, cutting the unspent COVID funds? Because we've seen Republicans talk about that quite extensively. Uh, you know, we've we've heard that as well. Um, we're not going to talk about the the different elements of this, but uh, you know questions about you know permitting reform, unspent COVID funds, um, you know all of those are you know being discussed uh, by the White House negotiators and and the congressional majority negotiators. Um, we think that those are you know conversations that that can be had. I think both sides might disagree on on what is. You know, unspent, unobligated, uh, all of those terms uh, that we talk about, you know, here um, and what that means. But um, look, if there are savings to be had, uh, we're willing to entertain them. Last question. The other day, uh, President Biden said, on the merits, I would be blameless. On the politics, no one would be blameless. Do you think this was all on Republicans? Or do you think both sides deserve some blame here? Look, I think the American public expects their leaders to solve problems uh, and to help make their lives better. And uh, right now, as we get closer to default, that's that's not helping. Uh, we could see, as the vice chair mentioned, um, you know, real harm to families and communities. Interest rates could rise. Um, borrowing levels uh, could be elevated. Uh, costs to borrow um, uh, that hurt the American family, uh, rising interest rates affecting car payments and housing payments. Uh, those are real things. And, and, and that's what matters, and that's what the American public will judge us on. Uh, we're, we're less concerned about that. And we're more concerned about uh, solutions um, and uh, how we avoid uh, this, uh, uh, this default. Thank you so much.